Let us now read God's word in Judges chapter 9. Judges 9, as we begin a new series dealing with Abimelech. Judges 9, verses 1 through 24. And Abimelech, the son of Jerubal, another name for Gideon, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it is better for you, either that all the sons of Jerubal, which are threescore and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's brethren speak of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem, all these words, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. And they gave him threescore and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Berith, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. And he went unto his father's house at Ophrah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubal, being threescore and ten persons upon one stone. Notwithstanding yet Jotham, the youngest of Jerubal, was left, for he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, and all the house of Milo, and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. And they went and told it to Jotham. And he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim, and lifted up his voice, and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honour God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now therefore, if ye have done truly and sincerely in that ye have made Abimelech king, and if ye have dealt well with Jerubal and his house, and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands, for my father fought for you and adventured his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Midian, and ye are risen up against my father's house this day, and have slain his sons, threescore and ten persons, upon one stone, and have made Abimelech the son of his maidservant, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If then ye have dealt truly and sincerely with Jerubal and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him rejoice in you. But if not... Let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo. And let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. When Abimelech had reigned three years over Israel, then God sent an evil spirit upon Abimelech and the men of Shechem 
And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the cruelty done to the three score and ten sons of Jeribal might come, and their blood be laid upon Abimelech their brother, which slew them, and upon the men of Shechem, which aided him in the killing of his brethren. Amen. Beloved, to paraphrase a famous question asked on more than one occasion regarding Saul of Gibeah, is Abimelech also among the judges? After all, Abimelech, the subject of this new sermon series, is in the book of Judges. He is a leader in Israel and he's given a whole chapter of scripture Judges chapter 9 in fact chapter 9 is the longest chapter in the book of Judges as Job 25 containing Bildad's third speech is the third is the shortest chapter in the book of Job and that we looked at last week so is Abimelech then a judge? Is he to be ranked alongside and after Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Barak, and Gideon? Might be as well for some of you to memorize the judges for the test and catechism, which is coming up this week. And then we have perhaps Judge Abimelech, followed by the remaining judges, Tola and Jer and Jephthah and Ibzan and Elon and Abdon and Samson, and then moving to 1 Samuel, Eli and Samuel himself. And the answer to our question is that though Abimelech is a leader, a leader given a whole chapter in the book of Judges, and that's way, way more than all of the so-called minor judges, Abimelech is not to be ranked as a judge. The first reason, not the main one, but the first one, is that Abimelech was a wicked man who was not called by God to office in Israel, unlike all the other judges. Judges 2, verse 18 states, a programmatic declaration for this book, when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. These things did not obtain with Abimelech and the Lord was not with judge Abimelech because God not only wasn't with him but he wasn't even a judge and so we come to the second and main reason we know that Abimelech wasn't a judge because Abimelech is called a king Look with me in Judges 8, verse 2, the question of Abimelech to the men of Shechem via his family members in Shechem was this. Which is better for you, either that 70 reign over you or that one reign over you? Even more clearly, Judges 9 verse 6 says that the men of Shechem and the house of Milo made Abimelech king, not judge. And verse 8, Jotham's parable begins like this. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king. Judges weren't anointed. But the passage especially says, anoint a king 
over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign over us. How then ought we understand Abimelech? And this is important at the start of the series. How do we categorize him? He's not a judge. Not a good judge. Not any sort of judge. Even an evil judge. He is a wicked king. And though Abimelech is in the book of Judges... And so, in that sense, he is among the judges, with some being before him and some after him. Though he is in and among the judges, he is not really of them. Ungodly, usurping King Abimelech is better understood as a sort of appendix, a painful appendix, more like an appendicitis sort of an appendix he is a sort of appendix to his godly father judge Gideon so if you think of the book of Judges and this is helpful for us to grasp the book as dealing with judge Gideon in chapters 6 through 8 then we have the appendix to judge Gideon namely king Abimelech his son in chapter 9 So what you could say, to put it slightly differently, Judge Gideon is dealt with in chapters 6 through 9 in terms of himself personally, chapters 6 through 8, and then his son Abimelech, chapter 9. What more then should we say by way of introduction to this sermon and to this series about King Abimelech? What sort of A king was this evil man. Some of you may be aware, and some of the catechumens over the years too, that according to Scripture's own portrayal, some of the 40 or so kings in the Bible can be named memorably and accurately. According to the Bible's own portrayal, we can say of Saul, echoing Scripture, that he was a king like the nations. Solomon was a wise king. Josiah was a tender-hearted king. Melchizedek was a priest king. How then should we characterize Abimelech? Is there an accurate and biblical way of nailing him down? What sort of a king was he? And the answer to that, the answer given in Judges chapter 9, is that Abimelech was the bramble king. The what king? He was the bramble king. And the children might think, understandably, that's a sort of a a silly name. A bramble, a bramble king. What's the pastor? Pastor, playing at, isn't that just a bit, a bit childish? Did an adult really say that? Where did you get that idea from? Well, we read it. We read it in Jotham's fable. Verse 14, after three types of tree refused the kingship, we read, Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, etc., etc. And the bramble is, the bramble is Abimelech. And so it's not imagination or silliness on the part of the minister in this sermon to call him the bramble king. That's how, that's how scripture itself insightfully portrays Abimelech. He is the Bramble King. This raises the obvious question, well, what does it mean that he is the Bramble King? And for that, you're going to have to be patient because we're not going to deal with that in this sermon. We'll have to get to verses 14 and 15 for that. 
But something of the meaning of the Bramble King will become evident in this morning's sermon and perhaps even a little bit in this evening's sermon on Abimelech too. As we begin our new series on Abimelech, the Bramble King, in Judges chapter 9. Our theme this morning is Abimelech gets himself made king. And I struggled with the sermon title to encapsulate what's going on in Judges 9 through 6. And that phrase, Abimelech gets himself made king, it's not the greatest English in the world, to get yourself made king. And so in that sense, that's not a very good title. The problem is, though, problem, is that it actually describes, better than any other statement I could come up with, it accurately describes what he actually does here. He gets himself made king. And even that statement, how am I going to get myself made king? What sort of methods are I going to use? He gets himself made king. That statement accurately describes not only what happens, but implies, you know, that's not right. You don't get yourself made king. That's angling for high position. That's sinful. And we're going to see that that is exactly what happens here. Abimelech gets himself made king. We're going to look in turn at these three points. The plans beforehand how he's going to get himself made king, the schemings in Shechem to get himself made king, and the murders in Ophrah in order to get himself made king because he will stop at nothing to get himself made king, this bramble king. The treacherous events then that are recorded for us in Judges 9 verses 1 through 6, our text this morning, are all born out of Abimelech's ambition. The word ambition in the Bible and in theological things usually implies the negative. The word ambition could be used for a negative, sometimes a lawful ambition, a good ambition, like if anyone desires to be an elder for the right reasons, you know, that's a good thing. But, and so, I don't want anybody to think that the minister and the word of God are opposed to ambition. It could be a useful incentive. And, you know, I aspire to, to get a higher ranking in my job. I have an ambition to bring up children in the fear of the Lord. That can be used in a good, positive sense. So I'm not, and the Bible isn't against ambition per se. But the ambition here is seriously, seriously wrong. And that, this ambition of Abimelech was not only, not merely to be a judge, he was reaching for the sky, as it were. He wanted to be king. And he wanted to be king over all Israel, not just the city of Shechem or the house of Milo, or towards the end of the chapter, Thebes is mentioned, not just a city or two, or even a tribe, or several tribes, he, his ambition was to be king over all Israel. Judges 9 verse 22 states that when Abimelech had reigned three years over Israel, and so forth. Now how powerful his hold was over all Israel isn't the concern of the passage now but we can certainly say that his ambition was to rule over Israel and in some sense some meaningful sense he actually obtained that ambition he realized it and this ambition of Abimelech to be king over all Israel came with nary a single thought for Jehovah's kingship, the fact that this was Israel was God's people, and God alone rules over His church. I say His ambition was so great that this idea 
would probably hardly have even entered into his thinking. It was all about him and his rule. If you ask why did he want to be king, why questions can often be answered in many different ways. But why did he want to be king? From this perspective, he simply wanted power. Raw power. You could even say, this may go a little bit beyond raw power. You could even say his goal was brute power. It was very simply and very obviously with extremely little veneer all about self-aggrandizement. And only in a particularly wicked and brutal age could you get away with it. Because there's nothing in this chapter to support the idea that Abimelech made much of an effort even claiming that I'm, I'm wanting to be king in order to bring in a much more just society within Israel. Choose me as king and I will bring reformation and unity among the twelve tribes. If I were to be your king, I will drive out the heathen so that we can more perfectly possess the land which God has given us. He never even tried the like of that. It would have been insincere, of course, but he didn't even try it because he didn't even need to try it. Now, there were other ungodly Israelite kings who claimed falsely and who pretended that they would, if given the throne, deal with injustices, whether the injustices were real or imagined or exaggerated. Problems with previous regimes or state of affairs. Absalom, 2 Samuel 15. Absalom claimed to be a more loving and just king. Jeroboam, make me king and I'll do a better job than the arrogant, domineering Rehoboam. Jehu, I'm your king and I'm going to wipe out Baal worship. He made a presentation, a push for the people's allegiance to seek to win them over with something that sounded like good. But Abimelech's ambition, his naked ambition, because it was very obvious, was simply to rule. To rule over people. To rule over God's people. And the one who rules over God's people, in reality, is our Lord Jesus Christ. He rules. And he appoints some men in certain offices with their duties defined and limited with a certain measure of authority through whom he executes his government of the church and also in connection with and through the office of believer. And so in keeping with Abimelech's naked ambition for raw, brute power, Judges chapter 9 depicts him as a butcher. He was more of a butcher than he was a king. He goes around, just read Judges 9 on your own, he goes around killing people. He's killing people from the beginning of the chapter right to the end of the chapter. From his introduction in the word of God all the way up to his death and his mode of operation fits perfectly with his own evil character and wicked ambitions. Abimelech then decided to begin his power grab at Shechem. Why Shechem? There were several reasons. Think back in the scriptures Think in the scriptures, for instance, of David. David, when he was king, he ruled, first of all, for seven and a half years in Hebron, central in Judah. 
God guided him there with the Urim and the Thummim. It had important historical connections. Ishbosheth. He ruled from Mahanaim, a distance away from David on the other side of the Jordan, a prominent wealthy city, fairly central to the parts of the promised land that owed their allegiance to him. Well, Abimelech was brutish in his murders, but he was not a stupid man. He chose Shechem for several reasons. Shechem is one of the most famous cities in Israel's history. And I could give, and I may well in later sermons draw out some of these, but for now, I'll give you just one. Shechem is actually the first place mentioned in the Bible within the Promised Land in Genesis chapter 12. We read that fairly recently, some of us, in the Bible reading program. Abraham comes from Ur of the Chaldees. He arcs up to Haran and then he sweeps south into the promised land and God appears to him in Shechem promising him the entire land of Canaan and so Abraham builds his first altar and devotion to the Lord in the promised land in, in Shechem one aspect of Shechem's fame Secondly, Shechem had a central location. It is round about the geographical middle of Israel's territory and therefore a good place from which he can set about extending his domain. North and south, east and west, with the heart of his power concentrated in Shechem, his capital city. Shechem was also in the tribe of Ephraim. And Ephraim sought primacy among the twelve tribes. Or, if we want to understate it a little, Ephraim was very sensitive to preserved slights on its prestige. And perhaps this is most evident in the book of Judges. Judges 8 and Judges 12, though it's also evident in 1 Kings. And Ephraim, in these days, the settings of our text, had a beef with Manasseh, the tribe of Gideon, the previous judge. And this too made Shechem in Ephraim a good place to start the reign of evil Abimelech. Here's a fourth factor because there are several and Abimelech had thought it through. You would if you're going to make a bid for the throne or rather a bid to establish monarchy for the first time in Israel. You'd carefully measure it before you take such a dangerous, dangerous route. Shechem was prominent in the service of Baal. Judges 8 verse 33 talks about the nation of Israel. After Gideon's death, the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam, the Baals, and made Baal Berith, that is the Baal of the covenant. Berith means covenant. Their God. So Baalism is resurgent. And among the various Baals, the Baal, that is the Lord of the Covenant, ironic and sick, isn't it, is the most popular Baal. And now here's Shechem. There's a house of Baal Berith. Judges 9 verse 4 says, a house that is a temple of Baal Berith in Shechem. And now if I make this, Abimelech is saying, if I make Shechem my base, I'll be able to tap into the sympathies and worship of Baal throughout the land, and especially the most popular Baal at the minute, the Baal of the Covenant. That's a good, good starting place for my new kingdom. We can go further 
and say this based on Judges 9 verse 28. Shechem also had a Canaanite presence. Judges 9 verse 28 has a drunken Gaal, we'll introduce him later in the series, saying, verse 28, partway through, basically, why do the men of Hamar, the father of Shechem, serve Abimelech? The men of Hamar, Hamor, the father of Shechem. Now, in Genesis 38, Hamor and the men of Shechem were slaughtered by Simeon and Levi when they were still recovering from minor surgery, the minor surgery of circumcision. The men were slaughtered. There were some women there. And maybe then these women regrouped and they were known as descendants and of the family of Hamor. And that was a Hivite family within the broader often grouping of Canaanites. And so that these pagans were in Shechem. And here's, here's Abimelech. Here's Abimelech. And if he makes Shechem the base for his new reign, that is with these Canaanites in there, maybe he can bring them on board and make the Canaanites also sympathetic to his rule. There are many motivations there are many ways to get your ends, and Abimelech would stoop at nothing. But there's this, though, the last, the sixth and last one, which is actually probably the main one. Abimelech chose Shechem as his first capital in the beginning of his usurpation for family reasons. Abimelech's mother was from Shechem. Judges 8 verse 31 says that Gideon's concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. So Abimelech's mother's in Shechem and his uncles are in Shechem and apparently his whole maternal family are in Shechem. And they're going to support me. There's my, my base. There's my base. He was a clever man, Abimelech. He's going to begin his quest for the throne of Israel in Shechem. He's going to press to his advantage the city's fame and centrality. He's going to exploit its connections with Canaanites and their resentments. He's going to exploit its connections with Baal worship, with tribal jealousy, and with his maternal family. And this has application <coughs> for evil men in the church, for those who would seek church office, high church office, and primacy even in a church or denomination. If you want to do that, if that's your ambition, exploit already existing fault lines, use your family, appeal to jealousies at any devious or underhanded ploy that might commend itself to you. And this is what has happened in church history too. The Bible gives us examples of evil men in the church and how they go about it. Now Abimelech knew what he wanted, the throne of Israel. He knew where to begin his seizure of power. Shechem. And now let's see how he set about it. First of all, in terms of the people. Put yourself, so to speak, ideologically but not emotionally, in the place of Abimelech for a moment. You could call a mass meeting with the Shechemites. 
and assuming everyone would come, then you could make your pitch, that is, approach people directly. That would, of course, present certain problems that would have occurred to Abimelech. What if I stand up and seek, as it were, for the support of these people to become king? What if there are objections from the floor, so to speak? What if we have hecklers, opponents, who throw in hard questions that I can't deal with? And then if I, if I want to be king really desperately, but if I stand up in front of all these people to promote myself as king, that's going to look selfish. And though it may get them to swing their, their vote behind me, so to speak, it may cause the problem that they then think that I'm beholden to them. It could fail. And if it did, I would lose face. And if you're aware of how Abimelech dies, losing face was certainly a big problem with Abimelech. Clue. He didn't want it said that he was killed by a woman. That would have been mortifying to him even after he died. So instead of the direct approach to all of Shechem, instead he appeals to his family, maternal family in Shechem, his uncles, his cousins, his blood relatives. And the idea is, I can get them on board first. Then I've got a platform, a base, a support group. And then, not only will I build my base, as Absalom did in 2 Samuel 15, but then I will get my family to enlist the rest of the town so that I won't appear too forward. This will look better than me pleading my own case with them and then my family will know the sensibilities of their fellow Shechemites better than I. They'll know how to persuade them. And again, there's less risk of failure and its consequence, exposure. So having looked at the people through whom he's going to work to achieve his ends, to realize his ambition, what about the arguments that he uses? Now, Abimelech doesn't really seem to actually need arguments to win over his maternal relatives. That's the way the passage reads. Instead, the text teaches us that Abimelech supplies arguments for his maternal family to use with the other Shechemites. Listen carefully to the first two verses. And Abimelech, the son of Jerubal, went to Shechem. Apparently he didn't reside in Shechem. The best guess is that he, with the other 70 sons of Gideon, lived in Orpah. Or Ophrah, rather. Abimelech then, to resume verse 1, Abimelech, the son of Jerubal, Gideon, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father. What does he say to them? He says to them, evidently they're won over right away, this is your line, this must be your pitch, so to speak. And I'm using words that are political words deliberately because this is really, this isn't godliness, this isn't government and rule in God's church. This is politicking. Verse 2. Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all of the men of Shechem, particularly the leading families and the movers and shakers, the influencers. Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it's better for you, either that all the sons of Jerubal, which are three score and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. He went to his family 
And he told them what they should say to the rest of the Shechemites. And it worked. It worked. We would say it worked a treat. His family immediately fell in with the plan. They agreed with him and they said that they would do what he proposed and they followed it through. And the Shechemites, particularly the leading families as mentioned here, they all agreed. It worked. Verse 3. His mother's brethren spake of Abimelech in the ears of all the men of Shechem all these words, and their heart was inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he's our brother. Let's analyze the arguments, the arguments that Abimelech gave to his family members, which they then brought to the men of Shechem, and which won them round. There are basically two arguments. The first argument proposed by Abimelech, used by his maternal family and swallowed, that's the right word, by the men of Shechem, was that of presenting two bad options. If I said to you, would you like me to take a gun and blow up, and blow up your right foot or your left foot? You would say, oh, I don't want any of my feet shot. Thank you very much. With that in mind, think of the question asked, proposed and asked according to verse 2. Men of Shechem, would you rather have 70 people rule over you or one person rule over you? The right response to that is, neither. Why do we have to have any of the sons of Gideon ruling over us? at all and then with a little bit of vehemence and sense springing up in the hearts of the people the Shechemites ought to have said if that's the option presented to us a plague on both your houses it's not right for the 70 men of Gideon the 70 sons of Gideon to rule over us or one 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 a plague on both your houses and for full marks and this is the sort of thing that can happen in catechism and especially later on you only give the answer especially later on for essentials kids and that sort of thing. But for full marks, the perfectly correct answer and the one which ought to have sprung from the hearts of the people of Shechem was this. The Lord rules over us. This is a threat and an outright attack on the kingship of the God of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of the covenant, the God who redeemed us from Egypt. The God who's given us his law and told us to walk in thankful obedience. We're his citizens. We're his children. We're his people. And then, assuming the men of Shechem had been right-hearted, they would have also been aware that Scripture, older Scripture, older than the events in Judges 9, did indeed predict that a king would arise in Israel. Genesis 49 predicts that, the famous word about Shiloh, about Christ. Numbers 24, ungodly Balaam, who against his own will prophesied of the coming of the star out of Jacob, another messianic prediction. But Deuteronomy 17 is even more explicit because it doesn't only speak about one coming king, Jesus Christ, it refers to a king and a dynasty being set up within Israel. But that same passage, Deuteronomy 17 says, God will choose the king. Not the men of Shechem. And not the men of Shechem being put under pressure Deuteronomy 17 says that any king to arise in Israel is going to make a copy of the law of God by his own hand and he's going to read and meditate upon that law. He's going to be and must be a righteous, faithful believer. And you say, what in all the world is that to do with the likes of Abimelech? An ungodly wretch nothing nothing 
There's no ground for anybody like Abimelech. It'll be in God's time, the man of God's own choosing, in his own time, and it'll be a righteous man, ultimately, that'll be upon the throne. And then they ought to have said, not only doctrinally are you wrong, but this is church disorderly. You're manipulating us, Abimelech, and the family. You are using crafty, deceitful, underhand tactics to get your own way to fulfill your own lusts and ambitions. That's the problem. And this often happens too in church history. People saying, well, you go and say this to so-and-so and you argue my case. That's the sort of thing was going on in 1953 in a famous controversy known to some of you. And it happens in churches where things begin to go wrong. Not right. Not right. Especially not in God's house and his holy kingdom. That was argument number one. The false, the false choice. The Hobson's choice. Well, would you rather one rule over you or 70 rule over you? Well, if those are your choices, I suppose it probably is better to have one over But those aren't the only choices. The Lord will rule over us. Here are the scriptures. This is how things must be done in the church of Jesus Christ. The second argument is, to put it very briefly, the appeal to blood. The appeal to blood. Or, to put it more explicitly, the appeal to family ties. First of all, we see this in verse 1. Abimelech goes to Shechem to his mother's brothers, communes with them and with the family of the house of his mother's father he appeals to his kith and kin and then secondly his family then appeals to the Shechemites and particularly the lead family in Shechemites and doubtless there were family connections there too so that the argument is stated in verse 2 remember also when you're when you my family are talking to the Shechemites remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And then when the Shechemites are persuaded, they're inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, here's their reason, here's their grounds, and it's chiefly one, he is our brother. There are natural, appropriate family ties. They can have influence and in certain instances they ought to have influence in our thinking. But if, for example, someone in your family says, come, let us fornicate or worship either gods, after all, after all, I'm your cousin. Or, after all, I'm your wife. And you're saying, well, what has that got to do with it? But if someone says to you, for instance, one of your own children, you know, Daddy, are you going to get me a birthday present? After all, I am your own son. Well, then that carries weight because ordinarily we do want to give them a birthday present. It all boils down to this in Judges 9. Abimelech, he's one of us. He's, he's us. He's our favorite son, Abimelech. And in church polity, this is called and is a species of nepotism. Election, here election to kingship, which wasn't even an office available, so properly, rightly speaking, in Israel this time. Election because of blood ties. This doesn't mean that someone can't get, or someone is automatically disqualified because of their, their blood ties. But it does mean that you do not appoint anyone to church office because of their blood ties. Well, we should choose him because after all, he's my cousin. We need him as an elder or a deacon because, well, he's my brother. That's my father. Bring him in. No. The Bible has qualifications for church office. And in general, with ethical and church issues, you do not decide them. Well, what is my family doing? What's my family doing? Would you be in this church 
if you asked what your family was doing? No, you wouldn't. I wouldn't. You say, what does Scripture say? What is the Reformed truth summed in the Confessions? What would Christ have me do? Not what does my uncle say, or what will my wife like me to do, or my husband. What does Scripture say? That's the rule. The rule in God's church and with righteousness. And all this appeal to blood, at the end of verses 2 and 3, is ultimately and basically in its naked form, it's all about selfishness. Selfishness. Appealing to the selfishness of the Shechemites. We're going to have a king, even the first king in Israel, and he's part of our family. Isn't that wonderful? Wow, the king related to us. And we're going to have a king now, Abimelech, and he's going to be part of our city. And not only does that imply a certain pride or prestige, ordinarily it means we've got a good chance at the high offices and at the wealth which will come from having Abimelech as our king because he's related to me by blood and he's a man of my city. And after all, there'll be jobs and wealth for the boys. I can get in the gravy train. Wonderful. An appeal to base selfishness. And this open and explicit appeal to what was basest in them, Abimelech's family and Abimelech's family's city, it worked. Everybody was on board. There wasn't a single dissenter, evidently, according to the opening verses of Judges. What a single dissenter. Everybody agrees. Unanimity. Unanimity in the church, you could say. We're all behind the new project. Let's make Abimelech king. There's something in it for everybody. We're all going to be winners. Of course, they weren't, though. And if you ask, why did it work? Why did it work so convincingly, so well, across the board? One answer is that everyone involved in this covenant with death, because that's what it is, was so genuinely base. When Abimelech acted the way he did, he was true to himself. He really was true to himself. But the himself was rotten to the core. And his family, they acted naturally, instinctively. They were true to themselves because they too were base. And the city, when the city swung behind this new proposal to make Abimelech the king, they agreed because they were wicked too. And you say to yourself, we're not talking here about political corruption in some city, the machinery taking over and jobs for the boys. We are talking about here an aspect, an element, a city, a region in the one and only visible church of Jesus Christ on earth. Shechem. We're not dealing with Ur of the Chaldees or somewhere in Egypt. Shechem, right in the heart of the promised land. We're dealing with people who were outwardly and by tradition and name the people of God. The Shechemites then, according to Judges 9 verse 4, were willing to put their money where their mouth was. They gave Abimelech 70 pieces of silver. Not 30, but really it was betrayal of the God of the covenant. They gave them, they gave Abimelech 70 pieces of silver to finance the new king in town. Where did this money come from? It came out of the house of Baal Bereth. What a place to finance Israel's first king. The money for the first king in the church that arises in the pages of scripture comes from the temple of Baal. And what fellowship hath light with darkness and Christ with Baal or Belial? None. The first king in Israel financed from the temple of Baal worship, the God of the covenant, the Baal or Lord of the covenant, financing the corruption of the covenant people in this king. With this money, 
Abimelech finances a personal army and once he becomes king it becomes core then to his royal army because Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. That is, he then bought the allegiance of the rudest, crudest, most worthless, reckless men of fortune among the people of God in the land of Israel. And it gets worse. What did he do? What was the first thing he did with the soldiers he bought and paid for with the money that came from the devil's temple at Shechem? Verse 5 says, He went on to his father's house at Ophrah and slew his brethren, technically half-brethren, the sons of Jerubal Gideon, being threescore and ten persons upon one stone, <coughs> notwithstanding Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubal, was left because he hid himself. And then you realize, now hold on a minute here. What was the great argument for Abimelech's becoming king? It was blood. It was blood ties. Blood ties mean so much. He's a real family man, this, this Abimelech. Blood ties with his mother's side. Oh, they're so close. And the blood ties between them to the city of Shechem. Blood ties mean so much. And then in the next verse, in the next verse, blood ties mean absolutely nothing. He kills his 70 half-brothers. And there's a word for that. That's called sheer hypocrisy. Uh, and it's hypocrisy because of selfishness, a selfish ambition. On the one hand, blood means so much whenever it serves his ambition, but on the other hand, it's absolutely worthless. It wouldn't stop or cause the slightest hesitation on the descent of the sword that cut the heads off his own half-brothers in his hometown of Ophrah. Wow. Wow. And of course, the slaughter of these 70 is very useful to Abimelech because these would have been possible rivals to his kingship. They're all wiped out. We won't, force, we won't face any opposition from those guys anymore. That's them out of the way. And by slaughtering them, Abimelech shows everybody that he means business. He is going to press through with this and that if anybody dares resist him this is what he'll do to them if he can and that'll cow people and he also in so doing binds people to him the 70 soldiers who've engaged in this they have to go along with Abimelech the men of Shechem well Abimelech you went too far well you gave me the money with which I paid for the soldiers who killed these men. I thought you wanted me to be king. Well, we didn't, we, we didn't want that. But No, but you did. You did. You're in this. You are in this. And this is what evil men do. They take over and say, you're in it. You can't back out now. Child molesters do that. Criminal gang leaders do that. It's no good you taking cold feet now. You're in it. You have to stick with it. And then the other implied threat is, do you think if we just killed the 70 sons of Gideon, do you think if you begin to show cold feet, we wouldn't kill you? You, you don't go to the root of evil men. You don't go in a little because you could be trapped. That's what happened to these people in Shechem. Very, very nasty. And then you think, okay, you said earlier, Pastor, that Shechem is in the middle of the land. Yeah. What about the surrounding tribes? And then Gideon. Gideon's 70 sons have just been slaughtered. And Gideon is the greatest judge in Israel's history to this point. The Midianites were very numerous. And it was relatively recent. And Gideon gets three chapters. Six, seven, and eight. And there's no evidence that anybody lifted a finger stop this from the surrounding cities or the surrounding tribes and if you think of the outrage of Gibeah 
recorded in Judges 19 through 21. The concubine being gang raped and dying. That at least, it was a dark day, that at least provoked the anger and the disgust of the other 11 tribes against Benjamin, which then defended Gibeah. And they took action to deal with, to deal with this in proper discipline. But here, here, nothing, nothing. Nobody stirs. You say, what must that be like in the church? And remember this murder, it was the murder of family by the man who really cared about blood ties. The murder of family. And this, of course, puts Abimelech right up there with Athaliah, grandmother Athaliah, who killed her grandchildren. She really loved, loved the kids, loved the family. So, well, dear kids. But if they're going to stop me from ascending to the throne, I'll kill them. My own flesh and blood, I'll put them to death. Mass murder is recorded here of 70 people. Jehu slew 70 sons of Ahab in 2 Kings 10. And of course, as I said, we're dealing with fratricide, the murder of brothers, half-brothers. The whole thing is in cold blood. It's carried out of a sort of industrial scale. There's a stone, right? You're next, whack. You're next, whack. They're beheaded, if that's the means they used. You think to yourself, this is, this is sort of a millennia before Christ sort of Nazi genocide. That's what they're doing. This is how the first king in Israel came to the throne. Cold blood on a stone. I wonder what they did with that stone afterwards. I wonder if they were able to get the blood off it. And it was completely unprovoked. They hadn't done anything, these guys. And it was public. Now, sometimes things are public by default. You don't want it to be public, or the ungodly person doesn't want it to be public, but you can't avoid it. But this wasn't like that at all. It was deliberately, unashamedly public. But there was one person who escaped. Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam. He couldn't have been too small because later on he's going to make a speech. He must have had quite a voice, although there was a good natural amphitheater. He hid himself. We're not to think he was like five years old so he could crawl into some, some little hole that others couldn't get into. He must have been a decent sort of size. But he managed to escape. And this makes you think of another figure who just managed to escape, although not so much of his own bat, king, later to be king Joash, when Athaliah was wiping out the royal seed. Here it's, it's Jotham. And then comes the coronation. The coronation of verse 6. All the men of Shechem gathered together. All the house of Milo. They made Abimelech king. By the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. So much could be said about that. We're not even going to deal with that Lord willing tonight. Hopefully next week. But I want to leave you with this thought. An important thought. In the midst of all the bloodshed, hypocrisy and wickedness. You feel like you need a shower. You need some good news. You need truth. Truth about proper kingship in Jesus' church. Think how different he was. He did not use other people or manipulate other people on his route to the kingship over God's church. He didn't put people up to do or say things and put arguments in their mouths so that he would get his own selfish ends. To go further, when Jesus came to rule, what did he preach? He did proclaim who he was and taught it wisely and discreetly. But centrally, he proclaimed 
the kingdom of God. God must rule. He came and preached the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Believe the gospel. That's the way of entry into God's kingdom. And he didn't go up and parade himself. Not putting himself forward. Not being proud. But humbly proclaiming the truth. And himself as a servant of God. Who came to minister to the needs of other people. And to lay down his life for the citizens. Because Jesus Christ didn't say I want to be king. And I'm going to slaughter people. Anybody that stands in the way of my opposition. He said there must be one person who will die. And it's me. And my face is set as a flint. To go up to Jerusalem. I know what's coming. I know what's going to come. But I'm going to do it in the service of my father in heaven and because of the people whom I love to pay the price for their sins to make a full atonement and satisfaction to God to bring them back to the Father so that we can reign over them in a kingdom of righteousness and peace and we're glad this morning that we haven't been duped like the people in Shechem we have a better king, the great king and we're in God's gracious righteous kingdom of light and peace. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that thou would bless us by the word. Show us afresh its riches, riches in the Old Testament, including unfamiliar scriptures which have their lessons too, and riches in the New Testament, the cross and reign of our Saviour. Help us, Lord, to use this day to honour thee, to edify ourselves, to encourage our fellow saints, and wash us in the blood of the cross, that we may walk before thee in a good conscience, with peace in our hearts, as the servants of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.